So good evening. Welcome to tonight's BTS evening meeting and firstly our annual general meeting. So I've had it confirmed um, that we have met the quorum of a minimum of 15 attendees um, who are society members um, so we can start the meeting. So the first item tonight is the James Clark Medal Awards. So I would like to begin by announcing that the 2022 James Clark Medal Award is to be awarded to Ken Spivey for his major contribution to the tunnelling industry by fastidiously capturing the BTS legacy in the BTS at 50 book. His nomination captured both the contemporary achievements and major contribution to the tunnelling industry. At this time, Ken is currently on leave and the medal will be presented to him in October. So please join us then for when we can award his medal. The next item we have is to confirm the minutes of the AGM on the 20th of May, 2021. So please can I have a proposer to agree the minutes of the AGM on the 20th of May, 2021. So that's Bill Gross, thank you. And please can I have a seconder? Okay, I've got to do it. Um, the next item then is the annual report of 2021. Hopefully you've all had time to read this, um, but I will give a little bit of a pricey. So for those of you that I think you know, 2021 um, was another, um, more of a year of two halves than the year before, um, but certainly not the norm. So the latter half thankfully brought us a little bit of momentary, a momentary period of normality to the BTS, um, which we all really enjoyed. So whilst it was not quite the year we'd hoped for, um, with once again the BTS annual dinner and the design and construction courses being cancelled. We did, however, see a short return to in-person events with, thankfully, the BTS conference in September, the in-person evening lectures from October to December, and also the BTS underground health and safety course in November. So we've all enjoyed that return to in-person events. And for me, I thoroughly enjoyed being able to actually meet the membership in person as chair. In light of another challenging year for many, we did, however, see a notable rise in our individual membership. However, we have had a slight fall in young member and corporate membership, which is expected to be due to the reduced opportunities for in-person events. And we do also have a slight continuing reduction in overseas memberships. So it'll be interesting to see what those statistics like, look like over the next coming year. Overall, we have seen an improvement in our net current assets and cash reserves, but we continue to closely monitor our finances in light of inflation increases and the return to in-person events. So the annual report and accounts are now subject to review by an independent examiner. So please can I have a proposer to agree the annual report for 2021? And please can I have a seconder? Next up then is the accounts have also been circulated and they are for the period ending the 31st of December 2021. Um, and these accounts are now subject to review by an independent examiner. So please can I have a proposer to agree the accounts ending the 31st of December 21. And please can I have a seconder? So the next item for tonight is the result of nominations for new BTS committee members. This year, we have had three candidates who put themselves forward for three elected member places. This meant that no ballot was required this year. So subsequently, the following candidates have been appointed to the committee. They are Daniel Garbutt, Divik Bandopadaya, and John Greenhow. So I just want to say a big welcome to the British Tunneling Society Committee and Kath, our secretary, will be in touch um, to onboard you to the committee for our next meeting in June. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the retiring committee members of those we have got Chris Presti, Ignacio Castillo and Sarah Langley. They have each made a really significant contribution to the running of the British Tunneling Society. In addition, at this afternoon's committee meeting, Sarah has been co-opted onto the committee to continue with the development of the BTS at 50 book. And we're very grateful for all of her support in this area. 
So the next item I have is to confirm the auditors for the ensuing year. The BTS is proposing the retention of auditors Jonathan Healy for the ensuing year. Please can I have a proposer to confirm the retention of the auditors? And please, can I have a seconder? So next brings me on to whether we have any other business. Um, please, can you raise your hand if you have any other business to raise, providing your name and affiliation? Have you got the mic? Have you got the mic? Good evening. Uh, Mike McConnell, retired from Uh Thanks very much, uh, Kate. I would certainly endorse the, uh, the fine work the committee are, are, are doing and have done uh, this year. Uh, the, the one thing perhaps I'd just note in general terms is that obviously attendances have not been too clever since Christmas. And uh, I'm just wondering if part of this reason is, um, you know, we've got excellent programmes going, but part of the reason is, I just found out tonight that the bar will actually be open until September and there's renovation work going on down there and there won't actually be a, a bar there until September. And I think that part of the reason is obviously um, that people like the social element of the BTS and I do think that if pressure, further pressure could be borne on the parts to be to see if there's some way we could have some sort of better arrangements to have a social uh, arrangement uh, for our meetings. So j j just first thoughts, I was just talking to a few colleagues tonight no, it, it's actually one that we've, we've just had a, a lengthy discussion on at the committee meeting. We do understand it is, it's directly correlated um, and it's great actually to see so many tonight. I'd say this is a really encouraging number to see. Um, we, we've got to come and enjoy this space um, and yes, it is, it's always been a, a meeting of, of three parts, that's how I've always seen it um, and the sooner we do get the IC bar back, the better. My understanding is they are recruiting currently, um, so as long as they can recruit the bar staff that is needed, we will be open in September. So I think if anyone knows anyone that is looking um, for um, bar work, then please look out for the adverts. Maybe we can encourage some to ensure that we can be back um, for September. So yeah, but it's just everyone keep their fingers and their toes crossed. Um, and I know that Rod in particular is looking forward to being able to, to celebrate having the BTS bar back. Does anyone else have any other business? Okay. So this, um, this now leaves me really in my final moments as chair of the British Tulling Society. Um, I would like really to just take this opportunity to firstly thank the whole committee for their support during really rather an unusual um, time as chair, being a pretty much a virtual chair, um, and for all our members who really kept engaged and active with the society during really quite an unusual time. I've thoroughly enjoyed my time as chair, even though it has been a bit different, and I now wish Rod Young all the very best during his time as chair of the British Tunneling Society from 2022 to 2024. So with that, um, we'd now like to do an official handover with Rod and basically say a big good luck and enjoy. Thank you very much. Good evening everybody. Um, what I think I need to do first is to thank Kate for the last two years and how she's uh, taken the BTS through some interesting um, and challenging times. So I'd like to all thank Kate for the last two years please. Um, right, we will now get on with the uh, meeting. Um, the first announcement I've got, um, some of you will um, know him, Per Mathon, uh, a mining engineer that uh, was 
the quay behind the French uh, side of the Channel Tunnel. Um, unfortunately, uh, passed away in April this year. Um, he was the key person behind the tunnel and the fit out from 1986 to uh, 1994. Um, he worked on previous, numerous previous projects before that time. And if anybody's interested, uh, there was quite an extensive obituary in the Telegraph. So um, I'm sure that you, you can Google that and you can have a read. So on to tonight, um, we have a presentation. We've got uh, two presenters uh, and we are on HS2 Chiltern Tunnels, a brief project introduction and progress update from a line JV after one year of tunnelling. We have James Riley, who is a senior TBM engineer for the Uptrack Tunnel and, the, and TBM Florence. James has been on the C1 contract for the HS2 programme since mid-2018, where he's worked through the pre-construction phase, site mobilisation and TBM delivery, assembly and launch. Prior to joining BRI Construction UK, James worked at Dragus in Hong Kong for over two years as a TBM engineer and TBM pilot. James graduated from Loughborough University in 2015 with a master's degree in civil engineering and is a graduate member of the ICE. We also have Shannon O'Keefe, is the TBM manager for both uptrack and downtrack tunnels. Shannon, uh, Shannon has been on the C1 contract since mid 2021, managing the ramp up of the TBM operations and tan tunnel backup uh, works. Prior to joining Bree Construction UK, Shannon spent nine years working in cost for Costain on London Power Tunnels, Hinkley Point C, Marine Works, HS2 enabling works south, and finally Thames Tideway East. Prior to relocating in the UK in 2012, Shannon spent over six years working for various Tier 1 contractors in his native Australia. Shannon is a graduate of the Monash University in Melbourne, a chartered engineer and member of the, both the ICE and the Australian Eng uh, Engineers Australia. Hand over to you. Thank you. Uh, evening, everybody. I'll, I'll be brief with uh, the safety moment, and then I'll hand back to James, who'll start the presentation. Um, I think probably everyone's aware from the, the media and the news that there was a fire uh, at the Alliance site last Tuesday. Um, I can give a little bit of a brief update to it, but obviously it's still subject to an investigation uh, with the Health and Safety Executive and the Fire Service. So uh, I don't want to prejudice the outcomes of that investigation and its timely completion. So. I'll just give a brief overview of what happened and some of the lessons that we can take away immediately as, as the professions, um, the professionals authority of the industry. Um, it was about 7.30 in the evening, the shift change. Um, the TBM crew were on their way in to, to take over from the bull gang, so we had three mechanical fitters on the TBM doing their, their various PPM. Uh, they stopped at about 2.5 k's into the tunnel to drop off one of the MSV drivers to take over his production MSV. The engine stopped on the PSV. The operator got out to have a look and noticed a, a flame within the engine bay. He attempted to extinguish it using a portable extinguisher. He then activated the uh, fire suppression system of the engine, which looked like it put it out. We started to evacuate the tunnel. We sent the fitters to uh, the refuge bay. So they were starting to leave. The fire reignited uh, and engulfed the PSV. We signalled a, a full evacuation of the tunnel. Uh, we sent the fitters to the chamber and told them to start it up and, and prepare to, to wait. Several hours passed, obviously the, the emergency services came to site. Um, we waited till we believed it had extinguished. The next morning we re-ventilated the tunnel and eventually we were able to recover the guys. I think it's pretty key for us to just remember that we need to plan and prepare for emergencies and keep planning and preparing. And I think it would be prudent to say that if we hadn't have done that accurately, if we hadn't have done preparation with the blue, service, the blue light services, this could have been a very different outcome. So. I think we should all just walk away from this and, and remember that uh, fire can be a pretty big risk within tunnelling, but if we do the thing right, everyone gets out alive. James? Thank 
Good evening, everyone. So we're here today to mainly focus on the construction of the uh, Chiltern Tunnel C1 contract a year after we've started. So as like I said, my name is James Riley. I'm a senior TBM engineer for the Uptrack Tunnel. And so just give a quick overview of what we're going to be talking about today. So first, I'm going to give a brief introduction to the project itself, then focus on the tunnels and then the TBM, which is, built, uh, which is excavating the tunnels. We'll then move on to some of the innovations that we have on our, on our TBMs before moving on to the TBM launch, have a brief sort of overview of the STP and the precast yard, and then we'll move on to the actual progress we've made in the tunnel so far this year, uh, some of the main challenges we faced and some of the challenges we have going forward. We'll move on to a bit on the cross passages, and then finally, any questions you may have. So I think by now, all of you are familiar, of what, familiar with what HS2 is. HS2 is a new high-speed rail line that's going from the south, passing through the Midlands and to the north of England. It's there to speed up the uh, speed up, uh, people moving from the south to the north, but obviously we know ourselves that it's to relieve some of the network that's already saturated, was already oversaturated as it is. Phase one is currently under construction and is split into three sections: the north, the central, and the south, and is under seven contracts. Today we're focusing on C1, which is the aligned contract. It's made up of three uh, three contra contractors. We travel public, Volker Fitzpatrick, and Sir Robert McAlpine, and we're supported with Align D, who's the the main uh, the the main uh, focus of J main uh, sorry, main uh, main contractor with, or consultant with this is the Jacobs with Indro. We also do have some Align staff working within Align D, helping the the, the the integration with the team, and obviously we're working for HS2 on behalf of the D DFT. So, the central C1 section, it consists of 21.6 kilometres of high-speed rail uh, with 3.4 kilometres of a viaduct going through the Clone Valley uh, to the southeast of the project. We then have 16 kilometres of twin board tunnels uh, going in the northwest direction towards Great Miserden. We have five shafts through those 16 kilometres and the south portal compound is the main focus for the logistics where all this construction is taking place from. We have roughly 500 C1 line IPT staff on site when you start to include labour, there goes 1,300 plus people working on the project, and with over 80 sample contractors involved. So the tunnels, they're excavated with two TBMs, Florence and Cecilia. The interior diameter of the tunnel is 9.1 metres. It's a slightly larger tunnel for a train given the high speed and the number of trains that are going to be going through it. The rings are two metres long and are 400 millimetres thick. There's a total of 8,000 set of rings per tunnel, with seven segments per ring, making up a total of 12, or 1,100, sorry, 112,000 segments total for the, uh, for the tunnels. All the material excavated from the TBMs is processed at the slow treatment plant, which is located at the South Portal site. And together with that, we have 38 cross passages throughout the tunnels to excavate. To briefly touch on the shafts, as I mentioned, we have five shafts to five shafts along the alignment of the tunnel. Four of them are for ventilation and emergency access, with the last shaft at Chesham Road being only an emergency egress shaft. It's unusual sort of having these number of shafts in the uh, in a high-speed rail, um, but it's sort of it's given that we need the emergency access for people to be evacuated out in the event of emergency. Um, Shaft design was heavily optimised during the design stage, stage one of, the, of this project. Initially, the shafts were at a diameter of 31 metres uh, with the first compliant design, but working together with HS2, our designers, we were able to heavily optimise this, end up bringing the internal diameters to 17 metres. So a really big success from, uh, from that at the early stage of the project and the early engagement with the contractor when we start a, a big project like this. The segment line design, so it's a universal ring with a 30 mil taper, so again we can place the key wherever we like in the lining. We have two EPDM gaskets on the inside of the face, and the intrados and extrados. This is due to the high water tightness requirements that were specified for the tunnel. We have standard segments which make up the majority of, all the, of, the, of the tunnel, and they are still fibre reinforced only, but we of course have special segments for cross passages, shafts, and um, added openings, which have a st uh, steel rebar reinforcement. But we also use some segments for specific geological features like faults and low cover areas where there are steel fiber reinforced segments along with standard rebar reinforcement within them. So again, quite a variety of segments. It becomes quite a complicated logistics exercise when we're in the, uh, in the tunnel. 
To look at the alignment that we have here, so we've got the, the alignment and the geology. You can see on the top, so on the top of the alignment, there's a lot of intersects of red lines which represent the faults along the line. We're going mainly through structural chalk, class one and two, with five different methodologies throughout the project. Um, it's relative, I'd say. It's not so. But it's thirty percent of the excavation is above the water table, so that represented a challenge when selecting the TBM. We have a 110 meters height difference between the start and the finish of the project. So it's quite a, quite a big gradient and it's going to become quite a complicated slurry management network, slurry management of the pumps towards the end. We pass under several third party assets. So we'll cover this in a bit more detail later in the presentation, but specifically the M25, uh, the River Misborn, and we have a Chiltern rail line crossing. But we also pass through five water source protection zones, which are run by Affinity Water, supplying the local water to the, uh, to the local community and areas of northwest London. The shallowest uh, radius of the tunnel is 2.5 kilometers, so not too much uh, bends in the tunnel. Um, so not too many issues with the design of the machine here. The TBMs, which are excavating the Chiltern Tunnels, they are Hericonnect Variable Density TBMs, and they have an external diameter of 10.265 metres. Uh, the first time Variable Density TBMs have been used in the UK, um, and I don't need to go into too much detail here, but obviously we have the shield at the front of the TBM with the, uh, the cutter head, hydraulic rams, uh, all the electrical motors. Gantry 1 houses the control cabin, the hydraulic power packs, the first slurry pump. Gantry 2, you have all the transformers, electrical components. Gantry 3 is the refuse chambers and canteen, so the welfare. Gantry 4 is the grout batching plant. We batch the grout on the machine rather than sending it through the pipeline, given the 16 kilometers that we have to pass. It would be too much of a risk to block up pipes. Gantry 5 houses the compressors for the, uh, for the bubble chamber in the front of the machine. And Gantry 6 is where the pipe loop is uh, located. Overall, the machine is 160 metres long, so a fairly long uh, TBM at the end of it. So you can see this is the rear of both TBMs here. And as I've sort of started to lose, we have some significant challenges, mainly fo focused on the slurry circuit management. So we have a total of 20 pumps for each tunnel to install and operate over the course of the, uh, over the, course of the drive. Right now, we don't have that many, so it's a bit more easy to operate. But again, as we go longer and further into the tunnel, it becomes more complicated. The wear of the components of the TBM has already been noted. Uh, we go through some quite heavy flints, so that's been noted when we've started the, uh, the excavation. So we've had to pay a bit more attention here. And the logistics management. We've got 16 kilometers to run to get segments to the end of the tunnel. We really have to spend a lot of time focusing on this side of it. So in order to help us, we've uh, put some more innovations into the tunnel. So some of the ones we'll bring up today is semi-continuous mining, the crocodile DVD robot, which I think some of you may have heard of. We have a Thalia training simulator, uh, basically to give uh, pilots that haven't operated TBMs before, before we launch the machines, the, 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 the option to train on it, to see how it's working. Uh, we also have Moby Dick, which Shannon will talk about in a bit of detail later and the semi-automatic slow circuit system, where we are taking the control away from the operators to operate the pumps and letting it run by itself. So very big innovation here, which we're working on at the moment. So to start with, I'll just mention uh, the, briefly the semi-continuous mining. So at the moment, the trial is still ongoing with HairConnect, the supplier of the machines. We've tested with both, it works. And the process is mainly involves excavating a length of Roughly two meters in length on the thrust cylinders, so it's about a meter of excavation given the length of the cylinders we have in the machine. We then would install the first and the second segment, mainly to stop any movement. We don't want to be building the rings on its own for it to be moving inside the tail skin. We then restart the advance and begin to install the segments as the machine is moving forward in a sort of pattern. So the machine is moving, the, rings are being, the segments are being installed as we go around, and we continue until we build S7. So at the beginning, We'd reach the advance, we'd stop the advance before we'd be able to install S7. But as our ring builders have got used to it, we're able to install the full ring while we're still on that last one meter of excavation and then able to continue on to the next advance. So it's a very effective system. We've noticed it saved time and there are definitely some challenges on the machine in terms of managing the logistics with the guys because it is a constant cycle of ring building excavation now. Through this semi-continuous mining, we've developed with HeraConnect the center of thrust principle. Now, in order to allow semi-continuous mining to work, instead of having a, group, a hydraulic pump for a, uh, for a group of cylinders, we've now had to have hydraulic pumps for each individual cylinder. Now, as many of you may know from standard TBM operations, you operate with potentiometers, potentiometers 
to operate groups of cylinders to control the direction of the machine. You imagine now if you have hydraulic cylinders, hydro uh, a potentiometer, each hydraulic pump, you'd have 14 of these potentiometers for the pilot to operate with. And that's not feasible. They'd be too busy with all these ones. So we've developed with HeraConnect the center of thrust principle, which allows the pilot to choose a position of the center of thrust. The cylinders all calculate themselves where, what pressure needs to be set for that direction, and the machine goes off like that. We've had extremely great good feedback from all the pilots in terms of how this is operating. So it's one of our real big innovations from, uh, that, that, that's come out of continuous mining and how we operate TBMs here. Next innovation is the Crocodile Dooby-Doo um, uh, innovation. So it's a tool to remove the woods that separate the segments which are brought to the machine from the, uh, from the precast yard. And the Dooby-Doo is then to allow us to uh, install the dowels which connect the segments together. So it's taking out people from a dangerous situation. In, traditionally in tunneling, we're, we're going on, climbing on top of the segments, working at height, and we're trying to take people out of this harm's way to remove the woods with a robot and even avoid people coming into this center of the, uh, center of the TBM where there's lots of moving machinery. We're trying to draw people out and use a robot to take over this. So I have two videos. I hope they're going to play just to sort of show you how it works. So this is what we call the crocodile robot. It skims along the inside of the segment and picks up the, uh, picks up the woods using an air, air jack. And once it's picked up, if it's going to pick it up, there we go. It then drops it off automatically into a bin where they're then stacked and removed from the TBM on the MSVs. So we have a, a, a jib crane located right above this where they, they're wrapped in slings and then they're just dropped onto the MSV while it's waiting. So we're taking people out of harm's way here to use this, uh, this type of uh, innovation. The next one is the Doobie Doo robot. Again, it's picking up the dowels from a dispenser that's located on the left of the, um, of the, uh, of the gantry. It's then automatically picking it out and then installing it in the segment while we're turning it before lowering it onto the segment feeder. So again, it's an automated system. It's the first time sort of a, a robot's been used in this way and it's been very sort of positively received. So I'll move on now to talk about the South Portal main compound. Now the South Portal compound is 40 hectares and includes 25 hectares of temporary roads and platforms. Um, you can see here we have the tunnels located in the, on the, towards the left of the, of the page, or sorry, the right to you, the right of the page. And we can see how close we are to the M25. We have our tunnel office in the centre, because again we didn't want to be all the way up in the main office and have to walk down to the tunnels every day, so it's been quite convenient for us to have our own tunnel office here. Um, you can see the soil treatment plant at the bottom, which is processing all the material coming from the, uh, from the tunnels. We have the tunnel precast factory, it has its own dedicated batching plant. And then just above, you can see the viaduct precast factory for the viaduct segments, which, uh, which we'll touch on in a second. Concrete batching plants for the shafts and the viaduct, and then the main offices at the top. So Florence launched on the 7th of May, pretty much a year ago. Um, the TBM was fully assembled, which meant we were able to fully commission the whole length of the machine. Now, usually we're in a shaft, you're doing umbilicals, and you're never able to fully commission the machine because you're having to do step by step each time. With us here, we were able to fully commission the system, which allowed us to basically push off and operate the machine from the get-go. Um, backup one was the heaviest gantry, it was 350 tons, so it had to be erected on uh, so shift, concrete shifting ways which were incorporated into the permanent structure. But gantries two to six were located on, were built onto bogies which were resting on rails. And this saved us a lot of time and effort having to install temporary shifting ways or permanent shifting ways which would have cost a lot of money and time. So for us we optimised by saying we want it on rails and allowed us to move in very smoothly. Bogies went onto the shifting way where gantry one was where the machine moved forward and it was a very effective solution for assembling a machine fully like this. The TPM launch, uh, we had a double seal launching seal. Uh, this allowed us to pass the articulation and build the first segmental ring as we pass, through, as we pass the TPM shield through the, uh, into the ground and avoid any grout or slurry leaking out into the vicinity. Um, again, all incorporated into the permanent structure so we do not, don't have to remove this at the end. And in addition to this, the tail skin, we assembled the first steel ring, which will be later removed inside the tail skin before then rotating it to assemble it to the, uh, to the rest of the shield. Uh, this proved very effective. We were able to grease the brushes inside the shield fully, because usually you're standing up on the erector trying to shove grease in and letting it just drop down and making a mess. 
we were able to make sure it was fully all greased up perfectly, and not, uh, not much mess made up here, and it rotated in a very good solution we had here for this. And again, it avoids assembling a steel ring, uh, so avoid steel, uh, assembling a steel ring as you would do a normal concrete ring, avoid having to bolt the segment, start it at the bottom. Not a very safe operation, we know, but so this is definitely advantageous here for us. Just to touch on the, 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 uh, the, 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 the thrust frame, again, very standard design of a thrust frame. Uh, it was propped, uh, propped on the, the shifting ways to assemble it, um, and we had it anchored into the permanent slab, and was roughly 41 tons in steel totally. So you can see the images here, very standard shape here for this one. So this is what the site looked like in May 21. You can see, again, Florence fully assembled. We have the shield of Cecilia fully assembled as well, uh, waiting for the, for the rest of the gantries to be assembled behind it. You have our STP with our spoil management area still roughly under assembly here, so the sheds which would be processing the material. And then you have our precast yard, which in May 21 didn't have too many segments. It had enough for us to start going, but uh, we, 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 you can see it's not, not to its full capacity. Fast forward to May 22, you can see the portal area. We have two tunnels going into the Chilterns. So area is completed completely full. We'd launched our invert bridge. Um, all the site setup had been completed to manage the logistics within the tunnel. Uh, the, the spoil treatment facilities were all completed. And our segment yard is full. So we have a lot of segments here ready for us to continue the operation. So to highlight some key achievements uh, of the project team, not just the tunnel team, uh, Florence launched on the 7th of May, Cecilia followed shortly afterwards, 12.06, on the 23rd of June, and so far we've reached 25% progress. For the CVV, the viaduct, they've completed 54% of their piling and installed the first of their segments to do the Clone Valley, representing 20% of their progress. And for the shafts, four of the D walls have been completed, three of them have been fully excavated, and three of the base slabs have been poured, representing 33% progress in this part of the job. So overall, the project is doing very well. As I mentioned, I just touched on the precast. 112,000 seg 112, segments need to be cast on the, uh, on the site, so a huge number for 16 kilometers of tunnels times two, meaning we use a total of 390,000 meters cubed of steel fiber reinforced concrete. There's a dedicated batching plant in the center of this facility to enable them to be pouring concrete uh, 24 hours a day, five days a week. We have two carousels, each with 49 moulds, and there's going to be 30 months of production. We have three gantry cranes to manipulate the segments to be able to load them onto the, uh, onto the MSVs, and we have a storage capacity of roughly two and a half to three months. So currently we've produced 5,300 rings, representing 33% since the start of March 21. The shift pattern we're currently working on is five days a week, with, a uh, with 10 hours of productive shift, so casting segments, with the remaining two hours left for briefings and, uh, and washout at the end of the day. Maintenance happens 24-7, because again we need to make sure the, the carousel is able to continue to produce. And we have a target of 11 minutes per segment, so from pouring it to putting it into the ovens. The daily week production is 28 rings a day, representing 136 rings a week. The slow treatment plant will, total, will process a total of 2.7 million meters cubed of spoil to be separated and dehydrated. So 80% of these spoils are extra fines from the chalk geology that we're excavating through. We have a descending section that's able to cope with a slurry circuit of 1,250 meters cubed an hour, and we'll filter press designed to, for 30 meters per day. Now we've overachieved this, we've done more than 30 meters a day on a few occasions, and this STP is still able to perform a match with us and we're able to recirculate the recycled water within a closed loop. We have 24 filter presses on site, uh, mixed pack filter presses, which are able to process 20 to 24 tons of material per hour. Now this is, I think, 24 uh, filter presses is the most that's ever been installed on a job site, so a huge, uh, huge effort from our supplier, MS. And we've started a trial replacing hydrated and lime uh, hydrated lime and sulfuric acid, which is usually used to process the, 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 the slurry coming from the STP, and replaced it with a polymer, which has had the approval from the EA. 0.5 kilograms of polymer saves us spending 5 kilograms of hydrated lime or, and 1.3 litres of sulfuric acid. So far, it's had very positive successes with the chalk geology using this polymer, and it's worked very, very well. 
So I'll now pass you on to Shannon who will talk about more of the key milestones and where we've got to so far on the project in the tunnels. I particularly like this slide. It kind of gives a bit of a, a brief overview of where we're at with a lot of things. Um, you see at the top, we talk about the cross passages, which I'll come on to towards the end of the presentation. Uh, at the bottom, obviously, one of the key advantages we have in terms of logistics is that we're able to um, process and place the spoil from the tunnels directly on the site, so we don't have to take anything external to the site. Um, in terms of the, the precast yard for the tunnels, we can double stack the rings, which gives us uh, effectively double the storage capacity. Um, for times where we're not mining and we're just producing rings. Um, the centre bottom pick is our invert bridge, which again I'll come on to in, a, in a, a little bit of time, but that allows us to do stage one of concrete behind the TBM, uh, one that provides a working platform for the follow-on contract of HS2 to do the track side, but it also allows us again to manage the logistics within the tunnel with a, uh, a greater amount of ease. Um, in a traditional tunnel with, with tracks, obviously you can only send one locomotive in and out of the TBM at a time. You have to build uh, additional crossings in the tunnel behind as you go, possibly tow a California crossing. By having the invert slab, we don't have that issue. Uh, and obviously then the tunnel itself, um, everything is able to be built and installed from the back of the TBM um, prior to the invert bridge coming through. Uh, but of course the invert bridge then serves another purpose, which I'll come on to in a sec. Uh, in terms of progress, so both TBMs uh, have clicked over the four kilometre mark uh, as, of, as of a couple of weeks ago. Florence is slightly ahead of Cecilia. Uh, she did launch first, so that's, that's not to be uh, too much of a surprise. Uh, installed 2,090 rings thus far. Cecilia, as I said, touched behind at uh, 2,039 rings. Uh, you, can see the, you can see the operation statistics of, of the action TBMs in a month-by-month -month basis since we launched. Um, I will preface that if you look at December and January, you need to account for, obviously, a Christmas break. And also, uh, in February, we reached uh, our first shaft at CSP. Because we were ahead of program, we took advantage of that and decided to do heavy maintenance on the TBMs. Um, we had come through quite a, uh, a significant amount of flint in that ground, um, which I'll come on to. Um, it's probably also worth, worth thinking about the fact that uh, in order to get these advantages at the start of the program, we had personnel actually embedded in with Heron Connect at the factory whilst we were commissioning the TBMs. So once they were brought to site, we were able to bring those people back and hit the ground running straight away. So it's a bit different just doing your, your traditional FAT uh, at the factory. Um, we also, as, as James told, talked about, used Thalia. So we had people learning how to, how to drive the TBM. We had uh, rector operators doing uh, learning on how to erect a, a ring in a simulator. So it kind of meant that once we got into, into tunneling, it wasn't starting out fresh. And obviously MS, who provided our STP, stuck around after they commissioned it to provide the operators um, learning and understanding of the, the function of it. Uh, in terms of peak performance, so generally speaking, we, we talk about the two TBMs together, not individually, but I'll cover sort of both here. Um, the best shift we've got, which James is very happy about, happened a couple of weeks ago. Um, his TBM got 11 rings in, or 22 metres, in a single 12-hour shift, which you can see by the shift report there. Um, the best week we've had on a single TBM was 88 rings, or uh, 176 metres. Uh, and when I, when I say we talk about two TBMs and not one, the best week we had was actually the week before we stopped, um, where we got 340 metres, 170 rings uh, installed. The best month we've got also on a single TBM, uh, 285 rings, uh, 570 metres. So um, you can sort of see uh, the bottom graph, the build time of the rings has come down quite significantly. Uh, we started out quite, quite high at over an hour. Uh, we've slowly built it down to less than half an hour. Um, Again, we'll talk about February, we took the opportunity because we were slowed down and stopped for maintenance to start teaching new people how to build rings, which brought the ring build time up again, but that's quite rapidly come back down again. Um, average time, as I said, is touch under 30 minutes at 27. Um, our absolute gun of a ring builder can do it in 15 minutes, which is phenomenal. Um, that's almost at the speed of the actual uh, machinery itself. Obviously, limitations we have, they are big TBMs, they need a lot of love, so we've got to do a lot of maintenance. Um, Obviously, COVID is no longer such an issue for us, so people are starting to take holidays again, which means we have to account for staff shortages when that happens. And obviously, weather. The weather doesn't so much affect the TBMs, obviously we're underground, but because we're handling and placing the spoil on the surface ourselves, when we have wet days, chalk doesn't tend to want to play, so it becomes a little bit more difficult to, to place. Uh, invert slab, so again, as I said, that, that follows on behind the, the TBM. 
Um, it's about 200 metres behind. We try and keep it sort of at about that range that allows the, the survey team to do the res build survey of the tunnel um, and also allows the invert bridge team to keep up with the TBM to allow the back end works, which again I'll come on to. Uh, best production we've got is nearly 800 metres in November. Um, we typically do two pours a day, um, five days a week. Um, we can do three pours a day to catch up and we can obviously go 24-7 with it. It's not ideal, obviously it doesn't allow us downtime to maintain the bridge, but we can do it. Um, the concrete itself, we batch it on site through the, uh, one of the three batching plants we've got. It's a very simple mix, it's 3.65 MPA uh, after about 16 hours. Uh, and what that then means is that when we do the two pours and we move the bridge up, we can send a fully laden MSV onto it and then up and over it uh, without causing indentations or, or quality issues with it. Um, we use a, a specialist MSV um, to bring the concrete down, so um, everything is sort of purpose built to do its job. Uh, it's, quite, it's quite handy. Um, it, it functions kind of like a, a cyclic um, system that you use for extruded barrier. So we've got three bays of 15 metres long. You've got the preparation bay, so the, the guys who work on that will go in there and prepare the invert. They'll check for any defects or uh, issues with the rings. They'll clean the area up. We'll install the, the pressure relief uh, pipe. We then prepare the shuttering for the pour. We concrete that area. We can then move the, the bridge up and allow the last area to cure, the area that we're pouring, and of course the preparation in the next one. Um, again, talking about automation, the entire system's got a, an automated levelling and screening system, which you can see in the picture on the left. So we don't have to get people in there when we're concreting. We do from the side need to use uh, pneumatic needles to help vibrate the concrete into position, but we can finish the level off and screed it using the entire system itself. The bridge just runs off mains power in the tunnel, picks itself up, drives forward, we set the position, we put it into its poor position and away we go. Um, we also use a lost formwork between the two, um, a stremer form. That's allowed us to go significantly faster. You pour up against it and once the, the concrete has taken its initial set, it holds itself in position. We can re retract the form off it, prepare the next bay. Um, in terms of back end works, this is probably where sort of the biggest headache comes into these tunnels. Because of the length of them, as James said, we need 20 pumps to bring the slurry in, bring the slurry out, take cooling water into the system, take uh, waste water out. We also then have to account for the cross passage team and the adits um, at each of the, the shafts. So that means we've got a total of 65 installations to put into each tunnel. So you think of that for two tunnels, 130 different installations need to go in. So the back end guys are quite busy, um, the bull gang as we call them, or the TBM support team. Um, as I said before, the, the, the invert has to stay quite close behind the TBM because we cannot do any of these supporting activities without that invert in place. We have to put a, a support deck in and put a pump in. We can't get an MSV past it if we would just have the invert. So we must get that uh, invert past it. So as I said, 20 pumps, two bypasses, 38 cross passages, two cooling skids, three substations, and it's two tunnels. So um, the other thing too with the MSVs is swept path. They take 100 metres to be able to move from one side of the tunnel to the other. So we need quite a lot of room to put things in as we go. Um, what's been really helpful is our methods team has developed that, uh, that drawing that shows where each installation goes within the tunnel. It helps us to plan ahead. It helps us to manage the program of the invert behind the, the TBM. Um, if we didn't manage the two together, the TBM could take off on its own, or we could end up having the bridge up behind the TBM. Um, it's quite, quite a good tool to use. Uh, it also allows us to bring in deliveries of steel work to do our platforms as we need them and be able to prepare them um, whilst minimising disruption to the TBM program. So an example of that is, is the pump platform there. Um, it's a modular service structure, so it's effectively a cantilever on two columns that we, we put in a, a six units for. Um, just to give you an idea of the learning curve on that, when we did the first one, it, it took six shifts to do, uh, six disruptive shifts to the TBM. Obviously, primary focus is to keep the TBM mining at all times. So uh, having now done six of them, um, the guys have been able to, to speed it up to two shifts of disruption. We've learned to be able to install the platform offline. We've learned to put the pump and, and the electrical gear in offline. The two shift disruption is purely when we have to cut the pipes over to the TBM. Um, another innovation that we have on the machine that we don't really talk about too much is we actually have two return pumps. So we have 2.1A which sits up on gantry 1 and then we have 2.1B which sits back on gantry 5. What that allows us to do is go past the point where we need this first pump or next pump in the tunnel um, but continue to have the head pressure to push the slurry back to the STP. Um, 
Then on top of that, obviously, when you've got 12 backup pumps behind the TBM, it becomes quite a difficult task for the pilot to manage the actual excavation parameters and keep the slurry circuit working. So uh, we've been working with uh, our colleagues in France um, and Harren Connect to get the automatic slurry process. It's still under commission, but so far it's, it's proving to work really, really well in managing the, um, the pressures in the lines behind the TBM. Uh, so the next bit, obviously, is tunnel logistics. Um, we have a surface control room. We, we probably typically would refer to it as a tally hut, but we don't actually use tallies on this project either now. Um, we use an electronic tally. Um, the surface control room, the man or woman in there is, is in charge of everything going in and out of the tunnel, um, and they're probably one of the busiest people on site. Um, if you think about a typical shift, we've got five MSVs, three PSVs, uh, and two concrete MSVs, in addition to then having two high ab MSVs, and um, our cross passage team. So there's quite a lot of vehicle movements in and out just for a standard shift. We've also then got electric buggies which are used by the mechanical and electrical team to be able to go and check various devices along the tunnel without having to wait for, for the bigger vehicle movements. Um, in terms of the logistical planning of, of construction, uh, the decision was taken early on to do all activities for the cross passages from the up track so as to limit um, any delays to the down track. So when I say there's five MSVs, two would operate typically for the down and three would operate for the up. Um, so you've got your three specific MSVs and a concrete mixer, but if you think about the example I've got up there, this is uh, CSP, Chelf on St. Peter, the first shaft we've gone by. A challenging scenario would be two cross passages under construction, plus the shaft and that works. We've got a 345 metre long zone, a TBM operating behind it, the invert bridge also operating behind it, anywhere up to sort of 10 MSV movements within that 12 hours in and out continually, plus the buggies. So um, it's, it's, it's quite a challenge to do, but it's quite well managed in the way that we, we operate with things there, um, being able to, to have that invert in place so that we can move vehicles in and out of the tunnel quite freely. Um, so when I joined the project, uh, the first, first machine, Florence, had just been launched and had actually just got sort of 200 metres into the tunnel um, and stopped, and that was to do the very first asset crossing we had, which was the M25. Um, I think it's no secret the M25 is possibly the busiest motorway in the United Kingdom. I mean, we look at it from our window every day and it's usually a car park. Um, it's also the first time a major tunnel has gone under a Highways England asset of this kind in such a long time. So obviously, when I say significant consenting and stakeholder engagement, I'm not really lying. Um, we spent a lot of time prior to uh, we actually mobilised the site negotiating with, with them uh, to get consenting to do this. Uh, obviously the first thing too is we're still in the middle of the learning curve, so we're trying to ramp up the TBM speed, but also get out from underneath an asset as quickly as possible. Um, I go back to something James said earlier, about 30% of the drive or so was in um, above the water table. This is an example of it. It was completely dry chalk. We had very low cover, uh, literally one diameter of the TBM. So we did quite a lot of ground investigation in this area, um, and it was quite indicative that whilst the chalk was very good, it was quite dry, it was highly permeable. So we sought approval and, and got it from the Environment Agency and Affinity Water to use bentonite in the face. Um, the, the risk there was that we would lose confinement, which obviously would then mean we're stuck under an asset with no pressure at the face. So we got that and we were able to get through quite, quite well. Um, it meant that when the first machine went through Florence, we took 13 days. We got to the other side, we stopped, we did our first cut ahead intervention. We took all the lessons learnt we had from that put them into Cecilia and we managed to, to halve the program and get through in seven days. So it was, it was really well done by the boys. Um, again, touching on some of the, the monitoring of it, we had carriageway patch scanning, which was continuously reading. Um, we had to take uh, tilt sensors on the sheet pile walls either side. We also had a large gantry with speed signs on it. Um, and we had board, board pile walls with prisms. Um, between the two TBMs, our geotechnical surface monitoring team would take what we call a face loss, so we were able to measure what kind of impact we were having, whether one machine was going, whether both machines were going. Um, we did 12 months of baseline monitoring um, before we were permitted to cross to establish um, what the, the, the activity of the, the roadway would look like, um, and we've continued, obviously, monitoring since we've crossed. We've had no major movements on it. We've had, uh, in the magnitude of less than 100 times of the permitted movement, so um, it's been quite good. Um, one of my favourite parts of, of working on this job, um, and our competition in Vinci would love to get their hands on this, is the uh, Moby Dick system. Um, if you take a look at these, these pictures, I think it's quite telling of how good this system is. Uh, you look at the one at the top, you can see when we've got large, large chunks of flint, 
Uh, and the one at the bottom we can see when we've got flint bands arriving. Um, we knew that the drive from, from the South Portal to Chalfont St Peter was highly flintous, up to 12% by excavated volume of nodular flints. Um, obviously flint is very abrasive on the, on the wear parts of the machine. So the Moby Dick allows us to see the wear on the, on the front of the TBM. I don't want to say it's a simple device, but it's, it's a set of instruments on one of the rollers that measures temperature, adhesion, um, the actual speed uh, that it's, it's moving, um, and it gives us quite a good stereographic singular projection of, of the ground ahead of us. Um, obviously, because we were in highly flinted ground, we, we tried to stop everywhere between 300 and 500 metres to have a good look at the, the cut ahead. It also allowed a geotechnical team to get in and, and face map and get some really good uh, information to, to compare the, the instruction seats um, and the geotechnical uh, presumptions we had prior to, to tunnelling. In addition to that, we had quite a bit of wear monitoring on the slurry loop. Obviously, the pipes take a fair old beating when you're pushing slurry through them. The screw conveyor, you know, variable density machine, not like a slurry machine. We don't have pumps straight out of the cut ahead. We have a screw conveyor to maintain that, that uh, ability to vary the density. The sizer, uh, and obviously then the STP wear parts themselves. Um, obviously, we, we had other PPM as we were going, so we would schedule rotating the compensator at the back of the TBM. We'd change pipes wherever we could, um, and obviously we'd look in more detail at some of the more hard wearing parts, like the screw conveyor and the sizer. Um, Shaft crossing, so we both, both TBMs crossed uh, Chalfon St Peter's shaft in March of this year. Um, the site was set up with a, a, a quite a big D wall, um, which we took our time to do, so we did a long crossing of that D wall. But we also put in a grout plug um, either side of, of the D wall itself, um, and that allowed us to stop for heavy maintenance. Um, uh, as I said, quite a lot of, of wear parts in there. You have a, a ground improvement system in place. We didn't have to worry about water ingress. We didn't have to worry about pumping water out. Uh, it also meant that we didn't have to really think about doing a compressed air intervention, much to the dismay of Mr Healy at the back there. Um, we also got in, changed our cutters before and after we went through the head wall um, and were able to get the TBM ready for the Misborn Valley crossing, which I'll come on to in a sec. Um, one of the good points, um, we caught a hole through the tunnel into CSP prior to the adit construction starting. Um, our surveying team, much to their credit, were able to close the loop off and we were only five mil off. So um, I think after three kilometres it's a, a pretty, pretty solid achievement. Um, another big thing that we got to do at, at CSP um, with Florence was change out uh, the tail skin brushes. Uh, slightly different to perhaps other TBMs that some people have worked on here. We had two rows of brushes, uh, a row of spring plates and then new rear spring plates. Um, we had the time to do it. We'd been through quite some bad ground. We'd uh, had new pilots, new engineers, kind of learning how to operate a TBM. Um, we had a relatively new supplier of tailskin grease who worked very closely with us, but we still had issues the way we were, so we had to change the, the brushes. We've managed to take learnings of that and apply it to Cecilia, but when we get to Chelfon St Giles, we're going to change the brushes on, on Cecilia as well. Um, it was quite, quite an intricate bit of work which James planned. Um, it involved doing it in three stages, taking out the rings in three different um, sections to, to go round the circumference of the TBM um, and get the brushes changed out. Um, the most recent crossing we've done uh, is the River Misborn, um, and this one's quite, quite heavily um, considered within the, the High Speed 2 Act. There's quite a lot of UNA surrounding it. Um, again, similar to the M25, we did a, quite an extensive amount of monitoring of, of buildings um, uh, pre, pre the crossing. So to the bottom uh, of the picture on the right hand side you've, you've got the Brow and London Road, um, there's circa 50 or so houses in that area and then up to the north of that you can see the actual River Misborn itself uh, as well as a set of shops and a, and a road through there. Um, we went high density with the, the TBM, uh, again taking advantage of the fact that it's a variable density machine. We did have um, two times the diameter of cover but we were crossing through the Misborn Valley so the face conditions did start to drop off quite quickly as we got close to the river. Uh, however, once we completed the crossing of both machines, we only observed uh, less than a millimetre of, of settlement. Um, I'd like to say that we took some lessons learnt through Florence when she crossed and did it in four days, bring it down to two for Cecilia, but it's actually more a product of the fact that the crossing for Cecilia was uh, a lot smaller than for Florence. Um, just for an indicator, the bridge that you can see there on the right-hand side, the TBM crossed directly underneath that, circa 24, 25 metres below it. So. Um, 
I suppose the little forgotten brother of, of our works as well is the cross passages. So we have 38 cross passages to be mined out and, and lined with sprayed concrete lining, plus the five connection adits at, uh, at the shafts. Um, I don't want to say they're simplistic, but obviously they've got three support classes, so um, cut and spray, cast in situ secondary lining with a, a mobile formwork, uh, and sheet membrane waterproofing. The average length is between 15 to 20 metres. Over the length of the tunnel drive, the tunnels converge, spread apart, converge again, so um, it allowed that construction to be done one metre advances. Um, prior to, obviously, our cross passage team actually conducting the construction of the cross passage, we had our subcontractor, um, Keller VSL Joint Venture, coming in and doing the pre-treatment. So, as, again, drill in, probe, look at the water, look at the, uh, the behaviour of the chalk uh, and inject grout to suit, uh, and then obviously look at canopy grouting. Um, in terms of the sequence, so I go back to, to the back end works for us. We have tunnel services running up on the, the, uh, the axis of the tunnel there. My team would have to pull them down and divert them. We'd then build the, the primary invert collar. We'd put the, the platform in. We'd hand over to KVJV, hand over to the cross-passage team. They'd come in, cast the rest of the uh, collar, so the columns and the, the lintel. They'd break out the tunnel segments, do their canopy arching, and start their, their standard cutting and, and excavating. Uh, excavation primarily using a Brock 500 with uh, heading attachment or a tunnel excavator um, and a small Mako or Ruger to spray it in using Amberg to control the profile. So um, great news for the cross passage team was they made their first breakthrough actually a couple of weeks ago. So uh, they're well on their way to their works. So, so that's it for us. Um, I would like to say that whilst James and I are very privileged to be here to do this, this wouldn't be possible with a number of, a number of people in our team, um, most especially Steve Parker, who's the cross passages manager, um, and Didier Jacques, who's our underground construction director. Um, one thing I should have said too at the outset of the presentation was, um, appreciate people do have some questions about the fire last week. I'll just remind you that because the investigation's ongoing, we're not going to be answering any questions. So probably best if you save them. But otherwise, thank you very much. Right, for uh, our mics that are going to be distributed around, please could uh, we have your name and affiliation before you ask each question, please. So, open to questions. Thank you. Uh, Hayden Davis. Um, I was the um, tunnel client manager for High Speed One. Um, could you just give us some details, please, on the, the grouting and the mix for the grout? And um, an associated question, um, I noticed that the machines are quite close together now on change, um, and the, the distance between the two running tunnels seems to vary. It started off you know, less than a diameter apart. Uh, just confirm that there's absolutely no problem with the two, you know, one machine overtaking the other. Uh, I'll start with the, the, the second question first. So in, in terms of spacing between the machines, um, we have a requirement from Affinity Water to keep them no more than 30 metres um, together, so we can keep them apart. Uh, anything above that, so we have. Um, with regards to grout, I assume you're talking about the annual grout for the TBM itself. Um, it's actually a pretty stock standard mix, so um, ordinary Portland cement, water, uh, a super plasticising agent, and we pump bentonite down, down to it, which we mix it in there. In terms of the onboard batching plant, it's two um, high shear mixes, uh, and then it's pumped to a holding tank before we inject it as we go. No problems at all so far? No. Um, if, I, if I was to be brutally honest, I was a bit suspect of it when I first joined the project. Um, having an onboard batching plant sounded like something that could break down quite a lot. Um, to its credit, it's been really, really good. Um, you know, it's a high shear mixer, so we don't have a lot of moving parts in there to clean. Um, we do get your standard problems at the front of the machine when, when it's left sitting for a while, but uh, no, nothing, nothing really, no, nothing before I join. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Evening everyone, uh, my name is Andy Irwin, uh, construction manager for SES Railways. Shannon, James, thank you very much, very interesting presentation. Um, just wondering, aside from the technical stuff, what do you need to get better at? And where does your next innovation come from? 
And for a contractor who hasn't yet launched, what's your top tip? <laughs> I used to work for Costain, so I'm not helping you. Uh, the top tip is uh, before you start and launch your machine is got to be standards. Your paperwork has got to be in all in order. We've definitely had a lot of uh, a lot of readiness review meetings to make sure everything was correctly in place, and that sort of definitely helped us going forward to make sure that, that was ready. Um, the biggest one, and I say for our because of our length of our tunnels, which we've already brought up, and innovation that we need to work on is the logistics management. It's it's huge. I mean, we're sending segments from one side of the precast yard. We've got three different MSVs serving each uh, serving one tunnel. When we come up to cross passages, it's really important the order gets correct because you've got a specific sequence. So you'll get one MSV loaded, it might not go into the tunnel, the next MSV will be loaded, and you have to make sure that order is very specific. So there's a lot of coordination with the surface uh, logistics controller, as Shannon mentioned, uh, to make sure that gets right. So the logistics, to be honest, is the most critical. We've got all the, uh, the cement, uh, the pipes, um, the silicate to be brought to the machines. So it's really maintaining that to keep the TBMs productive. That is our, our biggest challenge, the biggest technical side. We've also mentioned the slurry circuit. Right now we're in the basics, the start of it. We only have three or four pumps in the tunnel installed at the moment. We're now going to get, the further we get in the tunnel, there's going to be more and more pumps. That's why we're so keen to get our semi-automatic uh, slurry circuit system working to sort of take that offline now to allow the operators to be familiar with it so that when we do get too many pumps for them to control, they can just set it off and go. So personally, those are the, sort of the big things for us. Um, and I say the getting the start right, I think, is uh, the quite important to make sure you've got everything in place. Probably one for you is get your logistics of the cross passages right, because that could be your biggest clash. They've got one set of priorities, we've got one set of priorities, but we have to work harmoniously. Thank you. Well done, guys. That was uh, pretty brilliant. And, uh, a general question and then a particular design question. Uh, generally, I've been used to tunneling over 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and it's just so great to see the professional set up, spending a year getting temporary work set out like that. It's just like a permit and a town. And it's, it's, it's just so great to see, and that's why I think we're getting these seeming these great efficiencies coming through. Is that time spent in getting really the temporary works, really professional design and, and organised well. Design question. I noticed that the emergency shaft, exit shaft, was right down at one extreme end, I think it was at Birmingham Portal end, uh, and then the, the other ventilation shafts further on up. I'm just wondering why it wasn't, say, in the middle of the, of the alignment, so that uh, you were hedging your bets, as it were, in, in terms of being the best optimal location along the line of the shaft. So, from my understanding, where it comes from is the three kilometre spacings of the shafts. So, you imagine we have 16 kilometres of tunnel, they're roughly located at three kilometres. Um, the last shaft then, you know, there's a gap of roughly one and a half, two kilometres at the end where there wouldn't be an emergency egress shaft. So you'd have roughly five kilometres there uh, where maybe we wouldn't be able to install one. And obviously it depends on what's above the ground. You know, I mean, we haven't got there. Maybe uh, there's houses, uh, there's something in the way where we couldn't build that shaft exactly. So it was the surface. So it was the surface well, maybe dictating. Really yeah. But there is the dictation of the sort of three kilometre spacing. One down the bottom here. Yes. Sorry. Yes. Uh, Steve Parker, Keystone Tunnel. Um, excellent speech. Thank you very much. Uh, just to remind you, mainly to the committee, I totally understand what you said about fire, and you can't answer questions on that. Just a reminder, really, that via the BTS, uh, Donald Lamont, uh, Phil Martin, who's here tonight, and myself are on the European Committee for SEN the upgrade to tunnel machines underground, EN 16191. And right now we're on MSVs. So clearly we are looking. So I don't know if you have a time factor. Uh, we're very keen to do the lessons learned. So I don't know if you're looking at two weeks, a month, whether you have a factor on that. It's just a reminder to the committee that anything from that, that our committee to glean will be extremely useful. So thank you on that. Um, and my own question would be, the settlement, you see very excellent settlement results. You talked of the river of one millimetre. I don't know what your original calculation, and then the motorway was very good. 
what your original calculation is, one, two, three percent, what they were based on, and have in fact your separate calculation perhaps been too conservative because the value you're getting would seem to be fantastic. Well done. Yeah, um, obviously you didn't have a question in the first part, but I will we'll comment on that. Um, I think High Speed 2, uh, as well as Align, will be very keen to share lessons learned out of this. Um, this is kind of a unique application of MSVs, so yeah. Um, in terms of a timeline, we're working as fast as we can. Um, obviously, we're guided by the Health and Safety Executive, so. Um, in terms of the settlements, I, I mean, we're both not designers. Um, I just drive the TBMs as such, if you will, but uh, there's a potential that they could have been conservative, but we have to remember that we're, we're, we're mining through the Chilterns, which have a history of having all sorts of weird and wonderful performance, so um, I think typically we only tend to see green triggers, which is probably happy days. Um, I dread to, to get the phone call at 2 o'clock in the morning that we've had a black trigger and someone's house is disappearing, so um, that's probably something again to be taken as a, as a design lesson learnt by Line D um, towards the back end of the job. What is this like? Are you aiming for 1%, half percent? Less than 1%, ideally. Andrew Smith, I'm retired. Was it ever a consideration to bring the muck out in, in another metal, like on a conveyor or something like that? Was that your decision or was it, um, and, uh, it imposed on you? I, I'd just also like to ask how the MSVs are powered. So to answer your question just on the choice of the TBM, uh, we went through a very sort of iterative process taking into account a lot of um, a lot of uh, criteria. I mean, muck, muck sport, muck move was one of them. And the critical point for us is, okay, conveyor could be installed in the tunnel to take it out or to, to out to the portal. Then it's then what do we do with the muck afterwards? Because it's going to be when we're underneath the water table, it's quite uh, going to be quite wet. And so the idea of what do we do with it when it's out in the portal area? So by using this variable density TBM, we're able to pump it hydraulically out of the tunnel. We're then able to process it at the slow treatment plant into a dehydrated mix which then allow a dehydrated cake, which then allows us to place it much more easily in the, uh, on, on site. We're not allowed to remove the spore from the site. We have to keep it all on there. So it's, when it's dry like this, it's much easier for us to place. If we're having it with the muck spore. In addition to that, with the, uh, a, 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 using the conventional EPB, you have to use conditioners in the front to be able to create your, your, your paste or your material in the front. Because we're going through drinking water aquifers, we were banned from allow, or we were not allowed, part of the UNAs, to put any chemicals into the front. So right now, what we're using when we're using a slurry is purely the excavated material, chalk, and water. So to use to get that cake mix, we would have also that that uh, sort of the mixing would need an EPB. We wouldn't be able to achieve that to then convey it out. So that's sort of where we went mainly with this variable density to be able to pump it out to be able to use the mix outside then we weren't able to use an EPB purely because of the, uh, the ground conditions and the, the water table. The MSVs? What was the question? How, they How they powered a diesel? Sorry? Diesel. Right. Is that a problem? Sorry, is that a problem? <laughs> we, yeah, we looked at electrical MSVs at the beginning of the project, but you must remember we're going 16 kilometers, and I'd, li I'd really like to see an MSV <laughs> that can go 16 kilometers at the end of the project with 100 and 30 odd tons of segments without having to stop midway through to charge up to then come back out. So it's still early stages. It was looked at heavily, really in much detail, but they end up the diesel was going to be the most optimal solution yeah, for us. Yeah, I appreciate that, but you know, there's our issues with nitrous oxide emissions and things like that, which are much we, strict now. We do, we do run particulate monitoring down there. Um, obviously, we also run the standard uh, trollic system through the tunnel. We're not getting anywhere near readings of, of anything that would suggest um, that they're putting out harmful um, gases. Obviously, my previous experience in Australia, I've been on, on driven tunnels of 16, 17 metre diameter where everything's been diesel, and even that's that's been okay. Um, I mean, the other thing is we run, we run a ventilation system in there and we push everything to the TBM and then back out. So um, in terms of the worst air, it's actually generated by the cross passage team when, they, when they're doing their, they're cutting into the chalk and spraying, but obviously they use local um, de-dusting to do their, their clean of the air, so we do do air monitoring as part of part of the job. We've not seen anything as yet. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. So, Mark Leggett, um, Mark Dons. I just wanted to build on what Steve was saying and um, 
Shannon about settlement, and HS2 is that typical 1% volume loss for assessment. And I, was, I, went, I acted for High was England and Connect Plus on the M25 proceed. Yeah, and the, they achieved about 0.25 or less percent volume loss. It was very impressive, actually. And I would, would say I thought the whole operation across the M25 was very professional. So that's really good. Well done to, to you and the team. It was excellent. Thank you. Okay. One right at the back. Oh, oh, just oh sorry. <laughs> Go on, Bill. Uh, Bill Gross, independent consultant. Um, a very informative talk. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I noticed that you've got a very big site there in comparison with a number of uh, tunneling sites. And I just wonder whether you can articulate the benefit of having almost as much space as you need rather than having a constrained site. Uh, or, or conversely, whether you've got a view as to, uh, as to what the on cost is of having a constrained site. Uh, as opposed to as much space as you want. So you say we had a, a massive site. I can tell you that the, when we were delivering the machine, the site wasn't massive. <laughs> we didn't have any space to put anything anywhere. Uh, the, I have to say it has been really beneficial for us to have everything on one site. Now specifically we're for having like, the precast located on site is taking loads of vehicles off the road because we're not having to transport segments from somewhere else located somewhere around to be able to have the segments directly on site so it would not affect the local community. Um, we're able to keep much more of a better track on everything, I suppose, from a quality point of view, and we're able to follow up everything rather than having to chase where, where our material's going. Um, it's very beneficial from, from my point of view, but again, we're lucky where we are. You can't have it everywhere like this. I mean, the, the SCS sites in, in London, you haven't got the space to make a precast facility next to a network rail crossing. You haven't got the opportunity to be able to just deliver all your components at the same time. You have to be much more... Uh, methodical about it. So, I mean, for us, it's been hugely beneficial, I'd say. Sometimes there is a balance between um, how much space you've got and how much money you pay. Uh, and I wonder whether or not we, in the industry, we tend to settle for too small a site and not, not put enough of an argument forward for having a bigger site at the time. And I just wonder whether you can help with any sort of numbers as to what, they, what you think the on cost is of having a, a very restricted site. For which I can't give any yeah. information on numbers, unfortunately. I mean, having worked on two very constrained sites previously in London Power Tunnels and, and Thames Tideway, uh, yeah, space is a premium. So um, I think in terms of production um, and economy of scale, yeah, more room is, is obviously much better and you can probably economise how much you, you can save by that. I think that's probably an exercise more for high speed too, perhaps, uh, towards the end of the, the scheme to, to marry up the, the, the three separate tunnel contracts and see how the space in Birmingham versus the space in the Chilterns versus SCS goes, so. One right at the back. Thanks very much. Yeah, Dan, Dan Garbutt, Magnox Nuclear Decommissioning Authority. Um, so, you talk quite a bit about innovations there, and we all know that HS2 is sort of developing itself quite an innovation legacy. But often, as a contractor, as a as a, as a construction end, is is often at the thin end of the wedge with that relationship. At many times, maybe uh, if you could give us a little bit of a more of a talk about the relationship which allowed those innovations and, and what you would want to see going forward from a client to encourage more of that behaviour. As if the for for we who we work for. Um, they're quite an innovative company, like what has been tried out in various uh, constructions, you're always trying to push the boundary. I know we all are pushing it, but I don't know how to describe it. It's, it's basically always going to be a cost versus how much you spend into the innovation in the end. It's how much you drive the cost to say, well, we can do this, but it's going to cost X, are you still interested? And as you said, we're on the thin end and we need to push that drive to say, look, if we develop these and we have to spend the time and the energy to develop them, put the cost in, then you get something out of them at the end. For example, the, the, the robot has been huge, but it's only the first iteration. It still needs more development. You still need to spend some more time and energy. And it takes a, it takes a, a client to say, right, we, we believe in this. We're going to give it a go. We're going to spend the money for it for you to then develop it. So we've proved now from HS2 support that this works. You can see the benefits from it. You can now start to see, well, actually, this is a good idea. Let's try and spend a bit more money on it to push it to the next boundary. So I think it's it takes a step from 
the client to say, yeah, we're willing to put it out there and try your innovation, which hands down to HS2, they've definitely put themselves out there for this. But it's more just to encourage that step to then allow the contractor to try their ideas. I'm sure many contracts have many ideas on the table, but it's just getting that to, to put it into practice, to, to physically buy the materials, physically to try the materials, to put them in place. So that's got to be the biggest uh, driver there for me personally. So is, it, is that sort of designing the, the contracting mechanisms to allow that to allow that to take place? Because I think the way we do it is not that successful in many ways across many various different projects, not just within tunneling but within the wider infrastructure sector. And I know HS2 really does have a great innovation team, I know that quite well, and, and he's done a fantastic job on that programme. So yeah, thanks, thanks for your insights, it's useful. Any other question? Oh, yeah. Yes. Um, Peter Townsend, I work for Mark McDonald. Um, can you talk about interventions, sort of number of uh, free air to compressed air, and in regards to disc cutters, is it automatic that you just replace the outer diameter disc cutters when you do an intervention with gauge teeth, or um, do you get quite a lot of wear? Um, you know, the wear is not too bad on the disc cutters. Pete, good to see you again. Um, we, for the first three kilometres, tried, uh, as I said in the presentation, to, to do an intervention every sort of 300 to 500 metres. We were able to do um, every single one of them in, in free air, um, which was obviously quite helpful. We have prepared uh, to do low pressure head interventions. Um, we've worked with HTMS as our um, hyperbaric specialist. So we have that capability to do that, but as I said, we've been able to do it in free air. In terms of the actual uh, cutter discs uh, and replacement, um, one of our engineers gets the lucky job every time we do it to go in there with a set of calipers and, and measure the wear across the, the overcut back into the center of the cut head. Uh, and typically we try and recycle um, cutters where we can. So we'll repurpose them and move them about. Um, we've also tried a couple of different suppliers of cutters to see how their wear on them performs um, based on the ground we've gone through. Uh, at the moment, we haven't done a cut ahead intervention for, for coming up on a kilometre, and so far the wear is not looking too bad. Obviously, we've got the Moby Dick system, which gives us almost a, a view of what we're going into beforehand. Um, that, that, that's where we're at at the moment until we do the next, the next intervention. Thanks. One last question, if there's any more, or are we there? Yep. I can't have an in-house question, come on. <laughs> okay. I'm the Health and Safety Director for LIPV, so I'd like to thank the lads for giving a good presentation. Um, I'd like to answer uh, a couple of questions and, and maybe give an answer. Um, everything we do, we've done at Align so far, I would say, and, and it's something that I think affects the industry, and we're always looked upon quite closely from a health, safety and wellbeing point of view, but in fact, most of what we do is use prototypes. So we talked a little bit, a bit about a fire, and we talked a little bit about new, new uses and new types of MSV and PSV. We've got to say we were working with prototypes, and we've learned, we've learned quite a harsh lesson. And obviously, to, to answer Steve's uh, question, we intend, hopefully within the next seven or so days, to, to share the initial outcomes of our investigation. So, so I will sort of promise you that, um, and it will be shared uh, through the BTS and through the wider industry. So. Of course, we, we're morally obliged to do that. So, um, the other one around the diesel exhaust emissions, we've just installed £100,000 worth of new innovation. The first time in the UK we've got a real time uh, diesel engine exhaust emissions monitoring system from a, uh, uh, an Australian company called Pinsar. And uh, I think all of the HS2 projects will install that because it is a bit of a, uh, a push from the uh, BS6164 to monitor in real time these particulars. So, uh, that we would consider another prototype, but actually it's a, it's a bit of research that maybe we can inform the industry about the, the standards of things like HVO fuels and uh, gas oils, and if they are actually a hazard based on ventilation modelling. You know, so um, from that safety and health and well-being point of view, we're doing absolutely everything we can. And uh, I'd just like to say thanks to Shannon because, and James, of course, because we did have an emergency. It was managed exceptionally well. Um, nobody was hurt. All the plans went in accordance with um, the, the strategy um, for escape. Um, the fire brigade, we're in the midst of, we have three 
different fire uh, services. We, we have Hertfordshire, Buckinghamshire, and Oxfordshire Fire. They've all been involved in drills on the site. In September last year, we had 125 of them in one emergency exercise. Most of the most of the units that attended our emergency were part of that exercise. They knew exactly what to do. We knew exactly what to do, and all went according to that plan. And exactly what Shannon said: the more more effort you put into planning, the better outcomes you're going to get when you get an emergency. So, thank you to Shannon and James for the presentation and for their response last Tuesday. Because personally, I think 15 years ago we might have lost up to 18 people in that uh, emergency. So. The boys there have saved 18 lives, so I thank them for that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, um, James and Shannon, for that uh, excellent presentation. Um, we can see that by the number of questions that have been asked. Uh, we'll uh, progress on to uh, any other business. Can we have the slides, please? Um, right. The most important item, but um, not the ideal scenario. Uh, we have the bar at the Westminster Arms uh, round the corner. And unfortunately, it's not um, in the room downstairs. It's, um, we're having to use the, uh, the upstairs bar uh, for tonight. Um, and hopefully, we'll be back in September. Uh, there is sponsorship kindly by Heron Connect for this evening's bar. So uh, all get down there for your uh, pint from Heron, Heron Connect. Those that attended the dinner, um, the photos that were being taken will be available for download on Friday the 27th of May, so that's uh, a week on Friday. We will send out um, emails through the, uh, the BTS uh, listing to everybody so that you can have a look at the photos from the, well, I think it was uh, 810 uh, bookings that were on the, uh, for, the, uh, for the dinner. Bookings are now closed, but tomorrow is the Young Members uh, BTS conference. So hopefully all those that have booked on there will have an enjoyable day uh, for the uh, 2022 conference. There is a social afterwards uh, at Tattershaw Castle, Westminster. That is open to anybody that wishes to attend. It's not just for those that are um, booked on the, the course. And that starts at uh, 5.30 tomorrow evening. Our next meeting is Thursday, the 13th of June. 16th of June, yep. <laughs> Where I got 13th from, I don't know. It's small diameter tunnel excavation and secondary lining construction methodologies at Thames Tideway Central. Uh, it's an in-person meeting here at the ICE. Um, tea and coffee as usual at 5.30, meeting starts at 6 o'clock uh, by Ferrovial. Um, BTS design and construction course, very much um, at my heart. I've been running this for quite a few years now. Bookings are open. There are still plenty of spaces available. There's definitely a lot of major contractors that haven't put any delegates onto the course. So I please encourage you all to see who would benefit from being on this course. It's a great course, great feedback we've had over the years. So please look um, and see who can uh, be booked onto the course, please. BTS 50th anniversary book is still progressing well. There are some outstanding contributions. Um, Ken Spivey has emailed that around to those that um, still re are required to uh, do some uh, items for the book. There is still time for f a few more articles 
over the next month or two. So if anybody's got anything particular they want to add, please um, email in and we can get that arranged. Um, there is a final drive to get the publication done for the end, later on in the year. Um, so there is assistance required to help with administration, photo assistance, um, and some research. So if anybody's got any spare time that would like to be involved, um, please get hold of Ken or anybody else on the 50th book um, team. Um, a promotion or for tunnel skills. Tunnel skills um, do a lot for the industry. So these are the priorities and the current ongoing activities that they're involved with. We are looking at what the industry wants, what the industry is requiring for going forward. So anybody that's got any ideas of what they feel tunnel skills should be helping the industry with would be most welcome. Please um, get in contact. One of the big items that Tunnel Skills has been involved with is immersive learning. Um, that will be showcased at tomorrow's Young Members Conference. We are looking to take the next stage and move forward with immersive learning and how that can be developed further. So again, we're really look, looking to understand what the industry thinks we can do with it. The BTS is available on all these various um, forums, so please get involved, have a look at what we're doing. Okay, so thank you very much for attending. And um, again, thank you for James and Sharon, and we'll be uh, exiting round to the Westminster Arms. Thank you very much.